Okay, thank you everybody for for coming tonight, uh, this morning, this afternoon, wherever you are. This is uh, the first Wednesday of every month webinar series. Uh, so this is July. It's the first first Wednesday in July, and uh, today we're very we're very very lucky, and I am very 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 happy that uh, we have with us uh, Sanjaya Mishra, who is who is the He's an education specialist in e-learning with the Commonwealth of, of Learning. He's joining us all the way from Vancouver. Um, and he's going to be talking um, about barriers to open educational resources in, in higher education institutions in, in India. So, Sanjaya, over to you. Thank you. Hello everyone, uh, I'm Sanjaya. Thank you, um, Beatrice. Thanks to both GM for this opportunity. Um, uh, and all of you joining from different time zones, ranging from Australia, UK, Netherlands, and South Africa. Uh, and I must have missed some uh, other people on the list uh, so far joining, and I hope others might also join. Uh, th this is um, uh, based on my work uh, that I did uh, uh, at the Commonwealth Educational Media Center for Asia uh, um, before I came to, to uh, Commonwealth of Learning's uh, headquarter here. Um, and it's supported by uh, the IDRC Canada through the University of Cape Town, uh, which was the lead hub for uh, research on OER for development, which we called Roar for the D project. Um, so along with me, there are many other uh, project uh, leaders uh, in different parts of the, the global south. This is just one of the projects that the Roar for D supported. Uh, supported. And uh, uh, you will find some of the research results already on the net. These are shared. I'm trying to uh, talk today uh, just a piece of that bigger project that I did with uh, uh, when I was at Senka. So the presentation is titled Barriers to Open Educational Resources in Indian Higher Education. And at this moment, what I will do in order to avoid any bandwidth issue, I would just like to switch up my, my camera and we'll go only on audio. So thank you very much. Um, and uh, let's begin with the presentation. Uh, and just to give you a background that uh, um, most of you know about the challenges of uh, access to educational resources. Uh, it's always a problem. The cost is prohibitive. At the same time, we know the advantages of OER, but there is a slow adoption of OER. Um, and we also know that teachers are the, are the biggest producer of open educational resources. Um, but challenge is that why adoption of OER is not happening why many teachers do not share the works they, de they themselves produce. Uh, so those are the kind of background when I was thinking about the problems of uh, OER adoption, the, the, the opportunity to conduct a long-term research came from IDRC. So I was happy to be part of that. And I was conceptualizing this work through uh, four uh, lenses that uh, the people are not sharing, teachers are not sharing their work because of attitudinal reasons. There are more, uh, the, they themselves are probably not motivate, motivated. They also have issues related to quality and there are, are barriers to or challenges to adopt OER. So those are the kind of conceptual uh, issues, the conceptual framework that were underpinning the overall research that I, I was doing. We also looked at uh, using activity theory in our work to, to look at how uh, the, 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 uh, the action itself is determining the adoption and what are the, the, the institutional rules, the community pressure, uh, the division of labor, uh, those things come into play. So, so the whole research looked into a very complex gamma. And I'm just giving a brief about that. And there are a lot of research questions around uh, the, uh, to, uh, for answering. 
So looking from the attitudes as a motivations, quality issues and barriers. So this presentation will be on what, uh, what barriers to using OER do teachers perceive? So that's kind of answering those questions through the presentation today. Uh, if you are interested in the research results, I can probably send you the link and you can actually find it uh, about this research on our, uh, our, our Commonwealth of Learnings um, the institutional repository, which we call OSIS. So um, it's it's now available. So we also, uh, in order to answer those questions, we used a variety of data. We developed this scale, which we call Attitude Toward Open Educational Resource Scale. We had an uh, interview schedule using activity theory. Uh, we had a survey uh, questionnaire that used the attitude scale. And so you, it used both qualitative and quantitative approach. And we actually conducted four workshops apart from, from talking to the people in one of the online group called Wiki Educator India group. So we conducted four workshops at four different type of institutions. One was the dual mode university, which was both offering face-to-face -face education and distance learning. One was a single mode open university. One is a one is a rural a conventional university in a rural setting, and the fourth one was a private multi-campus university. So we chose these four universities because India has over 400 universities, and it's extremely difficult to get a, a survey or a, get a research work done on a population basis, uh, and resources were limited. So we thought, okay, let's choose uh, a typical universities and try to extrapolate data from that to generalize findings. So it was a practical purposive decision. These in institutions in these, uh, the leaders in those four institutions were known to us and would, they were approachable. So it was easy for us to, uh, to organize the workshop and get involvement of those teachers in the, those four in institutions. So the objective of the workshop, because people were not knowing about OER itself, so asking them questions about OER have no meaning. So we said, okay, we'll orient them about a little bit about his, history of OER, um, now what they can do with OER, and so that they can have a better appreciation about OER and open learning, open licensing issues. And at the same time, we can also distribute our questionnaire to the people, collect data, and identify people uh, for our in-depth inter interviews. So that was a kind of a purposive, you know, the workshop you know, kind of played a role of a, a, a a modified focus group discussion. So when you do a quality research to focus group discussion, you bring in people. So what we did, we used the workshop as a you know, focus group uh, workshop, we can say, you know, instead of focus group discussion. And we collected data during the workshop, you know, qualitative data as well, and we used that data for our overall research purpose. But one of the things that in the workshop was the, a group discussion of, on barriers to OER. So this was a group discussion uh, which followed a, a, a model uh, which we called um, a 248 model. So uh, when the, uh, the individuals st first started thinking about barriers on their own and then joined in diet, then, then went into form a quadrant group and then become a group of eight. And we uh, collated that data from the consensus that emerged as in each of the workshop, what are those barriers? And then we analyze that data as the whole for the for whole, whole country. So that was an, you know, uh, uh, was an experience to gather that kind of a, a, a data for the research work. So the workshop, there were other strategies. I'm not talking about those other strategies, but uh, we also did in-depth interview for 28 uh, participants from all the four workshops. Uh, and those are all full one hour length work uh, interviews that were recorded, then coded, and transcribed and coded. And all those are, in fact, all the research data are currently available uh, as uh, open data uh, on, a, on a site maintained by uh, University of Cape Town. So anyone can look at those uh, data was uh, available. So th the data comes from uh, 227 teachers and uh, including 107 from the Wiki Educator India group. But at the same time, we have only used 117 usable responses, of which 42% were female and 
uh, 58 percent were all uh, were men. Uh, let's come to the analysis part and what the research uh, 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 talks about in terms of barriers to using OER from the eyes of the teachers who were the stakeholders of the survey uh, as such. Because we were trying to, uh, the objective is to, be, uh, to look at the barriers and if we can identify this, those barriers, institutional policy makers need to mitigate those barriers so that teachers can adopt OER better. So that's one aspect of the whole spectrum of OER adoption. So how can we identify the barriers and how can we mitigate those barriers? So that's the kind of things that leads at the end. So what we find from the survey, we find the top barriers. Um, top barriers comes as lack of understanding of intellectual property rights, licenses, copyrights, and creative commons licenses. That's come at the top. The second barrier participants in the survey talked about was that current workload. They say they have huge workload that doesn't allow them to do OER work. Um, they also feel that there is no recognition at this point or re reward system for developing any OER work, 40% of them. Lack of technological support in the institution which is mainly related to when there is a problem with my machine in the office, uh, there is no one to help me to rectify the machine or uh, the software crashes down, something doesn't happen or ranging from issues like I have issues like bandwidth in my institution, there is no adequate bandwidth to access internet, there are uh, issues of blocking YouTube videos. So if, if I want to use a YouTube video uh, which is available on OER, uh, in my classroom, I can't use because there is no bandwidth. And there were uh, uh, another uh, about 30 percent of the teachers thought that uh, OER needs investment and resources from the institution, which they do not have institutionally to invest. So there is a need for uh, more resources that is to come from somewhere else, either uh, additionally as a project from the government or from philanthropic institutions to come from. So those are the main thing. But when we did the workshop, the workshop brought some interesting interesting data. So the workshop data were uh, analyzed uh, from uh, a different perspective and we said well, we categorize them and analyze into oh, the barriers that comes as whether it's a personal barriers, it's an infrastructural barrier, it's a quality issues, a legal barrier and poor awareness. These are the uh, the five main categories of the barriers that came in the workshop. You remember the we talked about the workshops, there was a session on barriers and th this is what the, the workshop uh, uh, participants talked about uh, during the group discussions that had, had that the 248 uh, group discussion. So what is here, here personal barriers means? The personal barriers means the items related to uh, lack of professional recognition, lack of personal time or kind of I don't have time because I have I have a lot of workload or I am personally not aware of OER or I cannot use OER, I don't have competencies related to integrating OER. So it was related to the personal uh, issues of individuals, those were participants. The, which was the highest that came about 22 percent. Infrastructural barrier or the items that were listed about 15 percent which again were related to the lack of bandwidth in the institution, uh, lack of appropriate software or lack of a repository in the institution to share. I can do something but there is no institutional repository to share. So those are the kind of issues were identified. Quality was highlighted by about 10 percent of people, 9.55 percent in the workshop and this is largely related to concern about quality of OER and this is also coming the teachers normally consider that whatever they prepare themselves are good, whatever somebody else prepares uh, if somebody else material available is not of good quality. That's the kind of kind of framework or attitudes that you find amongst most teachers in higher education and they consider using somebody else's material is also undermining their academic uh, no supremacy or academic leader stage on that sense or knowledge uh, uh, competencies on their field. 
No, because somebody else will see that oh you are using somebody else's material so they see that these are issues related to quality if you use somebody else's material you are not doing quality work so those are kind of issues and of course the legal barrier again around 10% of the the responses in the workshop came as legal barriers these are largely concerned about copyright that they don't understand copyright and they don't understand much about plagiarism now what constitute plagiarism is you know using somebody else's material available with an open license is not plagiarism with attribution is not really understood by a many people so they consider that no 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 copyright doesn't allow us to do that so lack of that and then another little less than 10% group will uh, say that awareness of others this is not about personal barrier they attributed that we are people don't know about who we are and therefore uh, people don't who we are is an issue uh, not uh, using of who we are is an issue of a community not knowing about who we are as such those are the kind of things came so we need to look at these things very carefully uh, in terms of mitigating what are the things that we need to do so that we we uh, uh, help adoption of who we are better so if we also did a little bit of more analysis to look at uh, uh, from the profile of the learners and if you look at that you now we looked at gender as something or whether there is a uh, barriers amongst male and female separately the uh, we really find that percentage wise i'm highlighting key items here only lack of time came actually uh, and both the groups and in top two barriers and uh, the uh, female teachers felt 46% time that uh, lack of time is a, is an issue for that whereas uh, teachers male teachers thought about lack of recognition as the top item and, and female teachers thought about copyright and licensing as things of course the copyright and licensing came as third for male teachers statistically uh, there is no no significant difference on any of the uh, of the um, uh, the demographic variables and therefore i'm just highlighting key variables uh, uh, key key differences here uh, in terms of age uh, we did really didn't find any commonality so there was a, a cross sectoral uh, uh, items like the older people consider a workload uh, the people below 35 years thought about recognition and and understanding of copyright uh people in between the, the middle group of 36 to 50 uh, they said lack of icd skills and bandwidth issue in, the, in their institution so there are a lot of variety of things so um all these are important items it's not just we are looking at but uh in order to develop strategy for capacity building or something you need to understand the age profile how do you cater to different people and the different groups so this 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 probably would help in that direction to 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 provide uh, customized training for people at the professional level uh, i think uh, between professors and associate professors workload came as a kind of a common top barrier um, and you can see that workload is coming as a, across the demographic profile and people at the at the lower level at the lecturer and assistant professors level they thought about recognition of their work is important and they need to understand more about uh, they don't know copyright and licensing issues much more so the over 50% is talking about that uh, people at the associate professor level also talked about that um, lack of financial resources to do projects things of that and these are people who really look for projects uh, doing bigger projects to become take a professorial position later on and you know to take external grants and they are looking for those kind of things so so i think it's it's aligned with those kind of uh, their their uh, their professional need to grow and what they are looking for so they are highlighting those kind of requirement and they see that not availability of bigger projects on oer for them in the country is a, as, as is a, is a barrier 
we looked at qualification wise whether people who are having phds or a research experience differ from masters and and uh, we find out some key similarities and differences people with research experience um, uh, like mphil and phd they talk about lack of uh, understanding of copyright and uh, licensing issues uh, but if you look at people with masters degree what they are only they are looking at recognition and lack of knowledge of using oer in teaching and learning this is uh, this is related to uh, kind of academic skills of integrating how do we use now this is also related to the concern about plagiarism and uh, uh, and those issues uh, people who are uh, you know senior have done some research and phd and research experience they know how to attribute and how to make use of um, others work appropriately to some extent so so those are the kind of issues you know and leading us to think about building capacities to integrate oer and developing more awareness integration of our, about copyright and licenses issues we also looked at uh, people who use uh, oer and people who don't use oer and if you see this these are some interesting facts about uh, people who use oer and people who don't uh, use oer how do we see the barriers if you see the barriers in this graph you will see the red one are on people who are non users and the 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 blue one are the users you see that the non users are uh, the barriers listed in all of the items we had actually 18 different items so uh, the uh, the non users always have uh, the barriers at the highest higher rank okay uh, but the users have always uh, lower perception about oer except in few of the cases like for example uh, users have indicated barriers on lack of technical support uh, lack of institutional policy and lack of time and current workload so those who have, those who have used oer they they have different they see that these are the barriers whereas those who don't uh, have not used oer before they have just said that you know, all those things are barriers in that sense so you know in a sense in order to focus on users to look at how can we mitigate the you those who are users we can focus on the users part and see that they are having barriers they need technical support they are asking about institutional policy to be there and they are talking about their current workload and time issues similarly that contributors we asked now some of them were contributors you now they had contributed some oer you know um, in in the research uh, in the, in the process so when we look at the oer we again find the similar pattern but the biggest in this is the workload they say that the barriers is related to workload and lack of time that came as an on top along with issues related to remix as the barrier this is more more concrete for us to to know that contributors uh, those who have done some oer work they know remixing has always been a issue because the licenses do not mix easily and you are constrained by the license conditions to create remix items and it has been a challenge and it has been an issue if in order to if you want to mainstream oer and we want to adopt oer we need to find ways and means to mitigate the remix problem which is created by this the license that we use and also we need to create release time for the teachers the workload of them doesn't allow this also comes from another angle that they are not looking oer as part of their own professional work as teachers they see they are looking at oer as a separate project work or something like that it's not part of their teaching and learning they do so those are the kind of issues that highlights from this study and in terms of barriers for us the key findings let me uh, come and uh, highlight in the overall in, in from this the this in the study is that there is a extreme poor understanding of licensing and copyright issues that needs we need to have huge amount of awareness building as well as capacity building of teachers the current workload is a problem 
OER, they think OER not integrated to their practice and see as an additional burden. There is no current recognition or reward system for OER work. Most of the time teachers tell that, okay, when I write a research paper, um, I get certain, in India there is a system called um, academic performance index and this is related to their promotions and they, if each article get a score and they have to accumulate certain score to uh, go to the next level from reader, uh, from lecturer to assistant professor to associate professor and associate professor to professor and so on and so forth. So they accumulate those uh, points uh, and those are the research papers are accepted. But when you do teaching and learning and produce the OER, uh, it is not recognized in any way. So uh, creating more awareness and building OER work as academic points for uh, teaching and learning. There is a recognition for teaching and learning how much hours you teach, but a material as such doesn't get. So they were most of the teachers were talking about those issues to be resolved at a, at, a, at, a, at a higher level. Most institutions don't have OER policy in India. Uh, uh, currently, um, there are few institutions which have started. Uh, one of the institutions is University of, uh, of Hyderabad, which is a central university. Uh, and uh, there are a couple of other uh, open universities and central university have adopted OER policy. But in terms of over 700 institutions, universities, the number is, is very low so far. So those those are as a barrier came in. Many institutions have also problem with technical support and bandwidth. As a higher institu uh, education institution, the bandwidth to support OER work and support teachers teaching and learning work uh, to be integrate, technology integrated in the classroom is yet to be supported in many, many institutions. Very few institutions has robust uh, internet, intranet, uh, yeah, and internet bandwidth, and also Wi-Fi enabled system. This is a big project for the government of India as well, and there is a national knowledge network that takes care of uh, of providing uh, technology bandwidth to the university. So those are the the key facts in the study. Now, what are the implications for us to to, to look at this? Uh, there is definitely a need for a national strategy to promote OER. And uh, currently, uh, uh, there is a draft OER, national OER policy for higher education in India, which talks about uh, this. Uh, now, in a sense, we can think that uh, it's a, our follow up, our research and, and advocacy work. There is a momentum towards uh, having a national OER policy in India right now. There is strong need for having uh, institutional OER policy. Um, in, and uh, that should also lead to having um, uh, OER repository in the institution. Uh, institutions also need to improve uh, about technical support and bandwidth. Uh, they should also consider providing release time for teachers. For example, to develop an open test book. If somebody is developing an open test book in one uh, then probably giving a release time for a semester for the teacher to develop that open test book and teach in the next semester uh, is, a, is, a, is a great idea that uh, that kind of approach can be taken. Of course, recognizing OER work is important for people unless we incentivize it's getting going to be difficult for people to adopt. And of course, capacity building should be part of a continuous process uh, to help their teachers to integrate OER in their teaching and learning. Consider that as part of their own uh, teaching and learning work and not separately as a, as a project uh, as such. Overall, uh, taking the uh, OER uh, barriers into account and other issues, um, uh, what uh, has been proposed in this uh, in, as a part of the research uh, that has been done is a model for uh, OER adoption. Uh, which includes uh, the challenges and uh, of the barriers, the teacher's attitudes, teacher's motivations, um, and the quality issues. So it from, from, uh, the, there is a model which is, is talking about, there is a positive attitude of teachers. Teachers are largely pos having positive attitudes. 
but there is also a need to be backed up by institutional policy. They are already intrinsically motivated. We need to provide a extensive motivation to recognition and collaboration opportunities, and we need to back up with our own knowledge and skills of OER. If if that happens, and along with assessment of quality, when teachers assess the quality of OER, they see that the quality, the OER comes from reputed and trusted sources. And if the OERs are fit for purpose, then what they do, okay, they will use the OER or they will adopt or contribute to the OER more, adapt the OER to their own situation, which will of course require improved ICT skills, more time and work and workload management system and uh, further skills on advanced OER uses about licensing and, and all other stuff. So th these are all different kind of factors that contributes to towards adoption of OER. This is a proposed model and hopefully institutions will take care of the holistic framework to look at OER adoption as such. So uh, there are a couple of uh, uh, recommendations, rather five recommendations uh, that the whole research uh, talks about. Improving advocacy and awareness, adoption of policies, providing incentive and re release time, creating quality assurance mechanism in each institutions, and providing continuous capacity building or continuous professional development opportunities related to OER for teachers. So I think with this, I will stop uh, and thank you all. And there may be many questions or comments that um, I would like to respond to the best of my abilities. Thank you. Excellent. Um, thank you so much, Sandeer. I, um, I have, I, I could, this, I've been recently, very recently, talking to somebody in in Scotland, and I can come in with lots of different questions. But I'm gonna I'm gonna open it to to our guys on the chat. So I know there was a few questions that popped up earlier. I'm gonna make the chat a little, little bit bigger so that we've got more room. So if you had a question, I know Robert had a question earlier, and um, and somebody else had a question earlier, so if, I'm going to ask you to type your question again, please, if you if you have a question. So there we go. So um, and Jay, do you see in in the chat uh, this Robert's question? Um, he says uh, lack of rec lack of recognition. Does lack of recognition recognition also include the publish or perish atmosphere at universities? Where development of of OER hinders your research, because that's one of the barriers that they find in at home in the Netherlands. Um, uh, to take off that, you know, um, it's it's a it's a publish and perish syndrome that teachers are more concerned about because the res when research gets higher importance than teaching, um, or creating test books or OER to facilitate teaching and learning. Uh, then, if teachers are more concerned about writing research papers, then to spend more time on finding, finding research report or, or articles or anything so that supplement teach, teaching, and teaching and learning. So um, that's, that's the kind of thing that happens. Sorry for the budge. So I'll have to tell. for that and uh, that question to some extent. Robert, you can type something more or mm. okay. Okay.
Yes, Rishis has said, was there a survey used to get that data? Um, no, the data uh, were collected through a survey, through uh, uh, the workshop uh, session on barriers and uh, through the workshop. No, I said it was, a, it was a workshop, which is like a focus group discussion, which was an extended focus group discussion, okay, and interviews. So the data for the study were conduct, uh, collected from three three different modes. There's a Jenny's question. So Jenny is asking. Uh, she was she she noticed that there there does not seem to be a strong consensus on on one barrier or another in the top three four. So she's worrying about um, different participants feeling different things were kind of more challenging than, than other things. Um, I think I think the top barriers um, overall, because if you look at uh, different variables and then collate that things, the top fives comes in. The top fives that I talked about um, in the beginning, the top five. Um, are broadly covering um, the overall barriers. So the top fives were these: the lack of understanding, the current workload, recognition, um, availability of technical support, which includes bandwidth and other things, and of course financial resources, because this is something that came from the people in the middle age group also. So broadly, you, we can see these are the kind of, these are the, uh, the major, major uh, um, the barriers which comes across uh, different, different uh, groups. I'm, I'm trying to look at other questions so that I can respond, but uh, you can alert me as well. I can go for Sukaina. Um, so Sukaina is, is asking about discipline related influences for OER adoption. I'm not sure if, do you mean, Sukaina, do you mean if this, you know, if you're a science teacher, for instance, you're more um, inclined to to do OER, to adopt OER rather than a history teacher, for instance, is that what you mean? Yes, um, uh, in my study, we have also looked at discipline influence. I didn't share that uh, in this slide uh, because I didn't find there is much variation across the discipline. Um, we looked at uh, disciplines like uh, humanities, uh, social science, sciences, um, commerce and management, engineering and technology, medical science. So we, when we looked at the seven groups, um, we, I, I really uh, didn't find much variation across the, uh, the discipline uh, um, in terms of percentages even. So I didn't find it worth sharing here. But if you look at the publication, the book on uh, OER that came out as a monograph, uh, you will find more details on that. I think Supina has that, but um, in this study, um, it's uh, it really did came out uh, very glaringly whether science teachers are looking at OER more or 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 the engineering people are looking at more. Uh, technically, in India, more OER are available in engineering disciplines because of the, uh, there is a program called National Program in Technology Enhanced Learning, which has uh, most engineering subjects are available uh, as OER. So, uh, and many engineering colleges do use that in their classroom scenario, which we didn't focus in the study. So, if we would have taken the engineering colleges, probably the study could have been a little different than what we did. Um, okay, I, Adrian is asking whether the 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 slide with the that oh can you hear me now? Okay, it's just I'm just uh, picking personal barrier. See, uh, the the personal barrier here is that something that hinders myself or an individual uh, to 
uh, do certain things which includes my time my workload um, uh, my own skills of uh, of uh, not knowing technology not understanding uh, oer licenses or not being aware of oer licenses which is related to my own uh, situation so it it was grouped in that that way uh, in in the uh, the study uh, particularly with related to the um, the the graph that i showed in the workshop situation Okay, Adrian is asking whether the lovely slide with um, with all the process is if that is in in the report. But I think it's 2016, not 2017, isn't it? Am I right? Can you repeat the question, Beatrice? I didn't get you. No, it's see the the proposed model. I think Adrian is asking whether um, whether this image is is actually part of the the report that you just published. The, he says 2017, but I actually think it's 2016, isn't it? This is uh, published in 2017. Uh, it was released in 2016, but it's a publishing thing. So we have it is a 2017. The work was completed in 2016, but the book was published in 2017, and the book was actually released in 20, 2016 December. But the publication date shows 2017, so it can be 2017 treated. Okay, um, we, we go to Jenny again. So she says, given that there is a more common sense approach to copyright related to publisher textbooks, what are the advantages of OER for Indian educators and learners? Ooh, that's a difficult question. So we're moving away from barriers as into basically what are the advantages? Why, why, why? Well, Few of the things that I have discussed in the major project is basis. Um, now, a lot of resources are being spent on creating uh, resources by the government. And if you don't release those things in OER, many of those material will, will get outdated soon. And then again, government needs to fund again those materials to be revised and our keep updated. Biggest advantage for the government to make things OER is to pass on the burden to the community to updating the materials. Once the materials are developed uh, as OER, the community can keep the maintenance issue easily. So you don't have to invest again and again. Okay, the cost of the materials, learning materials, are very high in India. Now there is no real study data on this, uh, but I know as a student. Uh, and uh, I know as a teacher, in, in cost of learning materials are not each, uh, um, are not low. It's as uh, high as anywhere else in, in the world. Um, recently, you know, some of you may be aware of there was a big case, uh, you know, court case uh, about course packs. So students largely use course packs recommended by teachers and depend on photocopied materials. Okay. So if, if, if OER, more OER is available and more teachers are using OER, then the whole course pack business, photocopying happening will also get reduced in the process. Okay. So OER and, and the advantage of cost reduction, increasing access to quality resources for everyone, um, Everything that we talk about in to mainstream OER has a, 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 as rational and value in, in Indian context. So when we are developing the OER pol um, policy, we were, we were talking about these issues, and the stakeholders agree that these are going to have. My biggest pitch on OER everywhere is not about uh, cost or not about uh, access. My biggest piece always happens is transformational and you know, ped pedagogical transformation due to OER. If you have an open textbook, 
you you have OER on, on video or audio or any other format, you can actually change your classroom teaching and learning to a different way. And your classroom engagement will be more active learning rather than lecture-based methods. So my pitch for OER, uh, not only in India, everywhere else focuses on that. Having said that, the classroom sizes in India are much higher than anywhere else in the world. So uh, there is a challenge in, in, in that as well. So that OER also helps in, in, in reducing that challenge by uh, the classroom size barrier. Not many advantages. I can go on and on. <laughs> Very good. I, I like that idea. Um, can may, can I ask can I ask a question, guys? Yes, I can ask a question. And um, what I find very interesting, right? Um, well, there are many I find very interesting. But the, um, this is a question for Sanjaya, But this is a question that you guys can pitch in as well if if you want. So when we talk about the idea, this need for for a an, a, a national strategy and for an OER policy. Um, do you really think that, so do we need like a top-down approach or is it better to kind of try and implement a bottom-up approach? Because I'm not, I'm, I'm in two minds and I'm not entirely sure whether it is, it is like a cultural, it's to do with culture. So, you know, you would think uh, here in the UK if, that if, if somebody tells you you have to do something, you go and do exactly the the opposite. Um, see where I'm coming from. So you might as well be working, you know, all the, the, the OER movement. I think it might have a better impetus if it actually starts from the bottom up rather than coming from the from the top to the bottom. Um, I don't know what you think. Just just. Uh, this, uh... Um, I I think that's that's a very good observation and and comment. Um, I think. Uh, as a democratic country, this is this is a challenge. Uh, Top-down approach um, uh, really doesn't help always. Um, when when something comes from the top that you need to do this, uh, there will always be opposition. There will be all be will be, be resentment in, in in a situation like India. Um, but uh, in the case of OER, people realize that. Uh, it needs a push from the top. If you, if there is no recognition for my OER work, and if I can do as business as usual, why should I do it? That's the kind of question comes in. And and if uh, if there is no policy, if I do something, somebody else is going to question my work. Okay, so there is a fear. Okay, so what is happening? Things are needed from the top that need to come with the policy, need to come with the, the uh, with the enabling environment. Currently, I really don't see an enabling environment existing for OER work. It's very sporadic. Very few people do and share their own work. Very few teachers uh, share their work publicly on their own website. When it comes to research work, it's really mature because the open access movement has little more maturity in terms of research work, uh, in terms of awareness building. Uh, uh, it, it, it has little, little has gone little beyond that. And the, the pressure on publishing has a different uh, dimension than the pressure on creating learning resources. Okay. Because I can be creating learning resources in my classroom and I may not share it with anyone. Because I may be doing PowerPoint, I may be doing animation, great resources. But I just use in my class. I don't need to share it. There is no compulsion on me to share it. Okay. So uh, the environment is not that. Just sharing environment need to be created, and that environment is only possible through a top-down approach. And the top-down approach should also facilitate bottom-up approach, like creating projects. If the institutions creates projects to teach, allow, encourage teachers to adopt OER. And there is necessarily funds available to bid for OER projects. More people will take up. So, what the the proposed model that I am trying to suggest is to create an enabling environment 
that allows uh, government and institutions to release everything they produce as teaching learning resource as OER and create a community of practitioners who will take uh, ownership of those materials created with public funds. So that the investment on creation of resources reduces over time and teachers take it as their own work and becomes bottom up. So it's kind of a two way push to make adoption happen, particularly in Indian context. That's great. I'm, I'm tempted to go on, but I, I'm conscious of the time as well. Um, so can I, can I, do you mind, um, just one one more observation. There's great chats there, and the scene, great things being said on the chats. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, uh, copy and paste that and share it with, with you guys um, if, if, if you want, so that you can, you can track um, what what's being what's being said but um if i if i, I could finish there but i'm 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 really i really have to ask this question as in because it's somehow connected and it's this idea that um do you find in india or do you find in the uk do you find in ireland do you find in australia wherever you are south africa um that maybe um if it's not all about sharing um do you find that teachers are still engaging in a certain amount of open practices, even if we don't call them exactly OER? So the awareness of OER is not exactly there, but they're still kind of using open content in, in ways that we're not labeled, we don't give it a label, this is an open practice or I'm using an OER, but still what teachers are doing, it can be regarded as open practice to some extent because um, that's what i found um, talking to teachers in the us uh, they wouldn't have heard about open educational resources but then they tell me that you know they share stuff uh, online maybe not necessarily with a creative commons license but they they uh, share with the whole world on, on youtube for instance In the study, um, we only found about uh, less than 20% of people um, contributing to OER in some way without calling or, or uh, in the name OER. That means um, they are doing an open practice. A little bit about uh, CC licenses, and one of the biggest thing they know is slide share. Now I can tell you. Slide share is one something some of them have shared their slide share and they have seen CC licenses option that they can put on their work. So that is one of the factors that you, you can talk about as having been done. But overall, I think it's it's pretty low in terms of openness and sharing openly because of a lack of understanding of copyrights and, uh, and uh, CC licenses because um, using somebody else graphics or pictures uh, they use often on their powerpoint in the class without attribution or without permission and other things and uh, they cannot put it on the online you know those graphics so they are, they are concerned about those issues as well so open practices uh, are determined uh, by a better understanding of uh, of copyright issues what can be done and what cannot be done so uh, that's that's uh, the kind of issues, uh, and I see some of the, the thread in the in the chat box about uh, moving moving from OER as such to OEP. Uh, it's not just moving, but think I I normally consider it as thinking OER work as part of teaching and learning, not as an additional add-on effect. Uh, to my work. So it's part of my academic practices. If I'm teaching in classroom, if, if I'm teaching to my 20 students on my slide or on my lecture note, what's wrong for me not to share that with the general public? What stops me from doing that? Now, every teacher need to ask that question. 
if i have misused some somebody's else work for my 20 students and therefore i don't want to make it public that tells me certain other story now if you do something wrong for 20 students it's wrong if you do for 100 students it's wrong so we need to change our academic practices in order to adopt oer more in our own open practices or open educational practices to that extent institutions are also not ready and that's why the top down approach comes into institutions need to have policies to do those things and mandate that teachers need to share what they are doing in the classroom unless we ask them to share that what you are doing in the classroom need to be shared uh, so that students can go back and reuse it those are the kind of pressures need to to be done in the system so it's not one way round it's, it's it's quite complex being a big country and large number of institutions large number of stakeholders it is it, it is actually a very complex a very complex issue i am i think i'm going to leave it here because it's just already after after 9 um thank you very much to sanjay it's it's been a, i mean i always say i always say the same thing after a webinar i think i would love to continue the conversation and it it's been great it's it's very very interesting work i i advise you all to go and read the the report because it's um, there is a lot of information in there and there's a lot that you can use to compare with your own situations your own your own context and then even come up with with more questions so um thank you very much again sanjaya it's been it's been fantastic i am i am i'm very happy that you have found the time to talk to us um for everybody else uh, thank you for for coming thank you for 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 taking the time to to come and 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 spend a few a few minutes with us and remember there will be no webinar in in august we we take a break uh, but we'll be back in in september so the first first wednesday in september we'll we'll be back and we already have a full program of of webinars until until christmas so Uh, all will be revealed in in good time so again uh, thank you very much everybody thank you sanjaya thank you to everyone who 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 taken the time to be here um, i'll talk to you again in september bye oh thank you